question I would like for us to consider this afternoon may be a bit uh, repetitive for some people as far as the answer to it, but it's still one that is much needed throughout the land, and we in the church, though we may know the answer to it, need to be reminded of it. The question is, can we understand the Bible? Can we understand the Bible? Can meaning am I able as a human being? normal human being able to understand the Bible. It's important to realize that some will acknowledge that the Bible has been faithfully preserved and translated and that it contains the books that serve as our authority from God in matters of religion. Oh, that's simply called the canon, if you ever hear anybody talking about it. They will admit that it is inspired of God in the original languages of the Bible, plenary and verbally inspired, meaning all of it and every word, as God gave it in those original languages, He controlled what was said. Yet, if you deal with people Many times they will contend that the Bible cannot be understood. To me, that's a self-contradiction to admit all those others and then say, but you can't understand it. Or at least they will argue that we need a guide to help us, such as some church authority. And of course, Roman Catholicism will tell you the Bible alone is not enough. They and their clergy, the bishops and so forth, what they call the teaching magisterium, they think are inspired of the Spirit as Paul and Peter were in writing the New Testament. And they must have that teaching along with the Bible. Well, you can guess which one will take precedent over the other if one of them differs. And it's going to be the church magisterium. So they contend heavily against the Bible only. They will others, many of them, some even in the church, will claim that they need help directly from the Holy Spirit to understand it. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit directly working on you, you can read the Bible all day long and it's not going to be understood by you. I heard this past week listening to a fellow, and that's what he was declaring, that you need the Holy Spirit directly working on you before you can understand the written Word of God or the Bible. But can the Bible be understood? Is it so difficult, that is the words of the Bible, is it so difficult that the common man cannot understand it? Is it so mysterious that only spirit led, and I've just defined what I meant by that, people can comprehend it? Well, in answer to such questions, I would like for us to first to note that the Bible was written so that man might understand God's will. So why stand up and say you can't understand it? In a way, it indicts God. He created us, human beings, to understand things a certain way. And when he revealed the Bible, he revealed it to us and for us and for our benefit to understand it. So if we say we can't understand it, we're simply saying God didn't know what he was doing. Many people don't realize in saying that, that they're implying that God didn't know what he was doing. Now regarding the Old Testament, Paul plainly said that it was written aforetime, written, words written, for our learning. You learn from it. He even said this to Christians. It was written aforetime for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. The law itself is said by Paul, Galatians 3 and 24, to be a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Evidently, the Jew was expected to understand the words of the law, and they understand it as God intended, then it would be a schoolmaster 
to lead them or bring them to Christ. I mentioned this morning in class that Jesus expected people to understand it. Remember how he said, have you not read? Matthew 12, 3, 19, 4. And on several of these, I will be deciding scripture, so be prepared to write them down. And I'm going to pause here and interject something that has nothing to do with my lesson. I'm glad to see Zach Nero standing back there right now. And glad to see you're up and around. Now back to the lesson. Paul expected unbelieving Jews to understand it in his preaching. In Acts 17, verses 2 and 3. When it talks about any of those preachers in the book of Acts opening up the scriptures, they didn't have a written down New Testament yet. What were they opening? They were opening up the Old Testament writings. You can see that in a number of places in Jesus' own teaching while he was on the earth. And the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures. What scriptures would that be? be the Old Testament scriptures, Acts 17, 11. They searched what they had. Timothy, according to Paul, understood as much from the time he was a child. His grandmother and his mother taught him, 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. Well, then the question may be raised, didn't some people need help to understand it? And they may cite the disciples in Luke 24, 25 through 27, in that same chapter, verses 44 through 47. Or they may note the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8, 30 and 35, Acts 8, 30 through 35. And we have to say, yes, because the Old Testament did not reveal everything God wanted to reveal. That's why the word mystery is used so much, especially by Paul in the New Testament. What had been hidden, what had been unrevealed in the Old Testament is now revealed in the New Testament. A mystery, according to Paul, that had been kept secret since the world began, as he said to the Romans in Romans chapter 16 and verse 25. He says also in that same chapter in the very next verse, verse 26, that it was a mystery now made manifest, manifest means known or revealed, to all nations. Paul would even point out that those Jews who would not believe on Christ and still attempted to live only by the Old Testament, were blindfolded, had a veil before their face. They couldn't understand. And all of this kind of thing led to gospel preachers of another generation. And as far as I'm concerned, my generation, I speak for myself, but say the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. God never intended the Old Testament here by itself forever. That's obvious from being written a full time for our learning, Christians learning, Romans 15, 4. A mystery now revealed by the Spirit to the apostles and prophets, he declared, Paul did, to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians 3, 3 through 5. I think sometimes we think Abraham was a Christian, Isaac was a Christian, Jacob was a Christian. Moses was a Christian. They just understood all that stuff that we have in the New Testament. They did not. They couldn't. It was not revealed. That's what he's saying. So yes, people needed that and people need it today. They need to understand the right division of the Word of God. And yet you look around about you and you still hear people who think Jesus is their Savior. And they'll still be talking about keeping the Ten Commandments. And they'll even call sometimes, it used to be done more than it is now, that the first day of the week, Sunday, they'll call it the Christian Sabbath. No such thing. You don't learn that from the New Testament. It's not. 
So with the aid of the New Testament, what had been a mystery not revealed in the Old Testament can now be understood. So we need help in that way, and that's exactly what Philip did to the eunuch who couldn't understand what was meant in Isaiah 53. Is he speaking of himself or some other man? And Philip began the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Now regarding the New Testament, you'll notice again that the writers of the letters of the New Testament expected their readers to understand it. Why did Luke write his gospel account? It was so that a person might know Luke 1, 1 through 4. It makes it very clear in the first four verses. He wrote to Theophilus. Why? To enlighten Theophilus. To give him knowledge he didn't have or needed. And we just finished the gospel according to John. And he plainly says, we quote it very often throughout that book and quote it in many sermons, John 20, 30 and 31. Made it very clear that he wrote it so that one could be brought to saving belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Because remember, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Thus he wrote words, the design of which was to bring people to a saving belief in Jesus Christ. And if you read through Paul's letters, since he wrote most of the New Testament, he wrote for people to understand. He wrote for them to have knowledge. 2 Corinthians 1.13 is one verse. Another verse is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Think for a minute. Paul writes this letter. He knows he's an apostle. He knows he's writing as the Holy Spirit guides him. Remember 1 Timothy 4? Paul wrote, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. It's the Spirit speaking. He's speaking words and he's speaking them plainly, and Paul's writing them. And yet he sends it to Timothy. He said, I'd like, like for you to have this keepsake. I wrote this at my own hand, but I don't expect you to understand a word in it. I mean, that's just absolutely ridiculous. And I'm served on the face of it. Now, somebody may say, well, aren't there some things hard to be understood? Well, yes, Peter said so concerning some of Paul's writings, 2 Peter 3, verses 15 through 16. And we might add to that the book of Revelation because we don't normally study those kinds or use that kind of language as they did then. But I can tell you this, they understood it, and we can understand it well enough to get the message of the book. It's one commentary I have in my, in my library. It says, the meaning and message, Revelation. I don't mind affirming to you that we can get the meaning in the message of Revelation, though we might not understand all of the symbols that are there. You can get the meaning and message of the book of Revelation because it too was written to be understood. But now who is it that misunderstands? Peter talks about that when he's talking about some things hard to be understood that Paul wrote. In 2 Peter 3.16, we learn that it is the untaught and those who are unstable that rest the scriptures. And he says not only the hard things Paul wrote, but the other scriptures also. And then we're expected also, once we become Christians, to grow in knowledge. 2 Peter 3.18, Colossians 1 and verse 10. And that's the way we mature. We understand. I always liked what I heard years ago when I was a young man. The Bible is as an ocean in which a child can wade in, but no man can fathom. It's the revealed mind of God. God gave it to us to understand the way to heaven. But I suppose if you could live here a thousand years, have the IQ of Einstein, and employ that IQ in the study of God's Word all day long every day, at the end of that time, 
you would still be trying to plumb the depths of what's there in the Bible because it will accommodate anybody, no matter how much they know, to continue to study. I think I pointed out last week, Paul, in writing to Timothy, asked that the parts which be brought to him, even though he knows his days are short and he knows when he's going to be put to death, he still wanted to study them. That, that's always impressed me. So as we mature in knowledge and practice of the truth, and that's an important point, it's not a matter of just knowing the facts of the case, understanding the information. The way the Bible's put together, it was given to us to put it into practice. That's how you learn to discern good from evil. And that's how you are able to grow to where you can handle, as the writer of Hebrews said, the meat of the matter, Hebrews 5, verses 11 through 14. So everything we've seen thus far shows us plainly. God intended us to understand the Bible. And we've seen the Old Testament is to be understood, and the New Testament was written to be understood, though I think we can say in progressive stages. That's what rightly or handling aright the word of truth. Give you an example. If you don't make a distinction between the New Testament and the Old Testament, You'll be wandering around over Leviticus asking the question, what must I do to be saved by Jesus Christ? And I can tell you right now, just staying in Leviticus alone, you'll never learn. In fact, you could memorize every book in the Old Testament and understand it in Hebrew as well as a, a Jew did in those days. And you will never know what to do to be saved from your sins by Jesus Christ. That was not the purpose of it. Now, we see the purpose of the law of Moses in particular. It was to bring us to Christ. So we need to understand those things. What I've said in the last few minutes, uh, moments, really not even minutes, if the world around about us that claims to believe in Christ as their Savior, God their Father, spiritual Father, the Bible, the Word of God, and the need for Christ's salvation, if they understood that much about the Bible, they'd understand a whole lot more than they know now. Do they make a distinction even between the patriarchal age and the Jewish dispensation as far as those parts of the Bible that cover each one of those ages? No, they don't. Now, you might go to some seminary or something and they may talk about it, but do they realize the implications of it? If you were a Jew, let's say back in the year 400 B.C., and you know the law is what you must abide by. It's the way you approach God under the law of Moses. But you thought you could go back and worship God just exactly as Abraham did because he's the father of the faithful. It wouldn't work because that's been taken out of the way. The law of patriarchy for the Jews gone. And they're under authority to God through Moses. So we need to understand how important it is for each one of us to have a working knowledge of the right division of the word and understand how language communicates to us. God is infinite wisdom made us to understand things in a certain way. And he revealed his mind to us on the most important thing in this world for us, our salvation from sin and the hope of heaven. So do you think that he doesn't want us to understand it or has given it to us to understand and yet we can't? I'd say rather we don't, not that we can't. We do things that keep us from the actual words of the Bible. If you will notice around you, a lot of people talk about God and Christ and the Bible. The Bible's the word of God. They'll talk about it. But how much do you see people getting into it and talking about the very meaning of the words and their application to their lives and what they ought to be doing and not doing and how they do it and when they do it and so on? You don't see that that much. God expects us then to understand the Bible. In understanding the Bible, we'll understand His will for our lives. And you'll remember that Paul wrote to Timothy specifically, and think of his work as a preacher, 
what a preacher is supposed to do according to the Bible. In 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4, saying that he would have all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. How are they going to do that and not know their Bible? Or if it's something you cannot understand. And he commands as much of his children in Ephesians 5 and verse 17. That's a simple question. Would God desire and command that which is impossible? That doesn't even make sense. He expects us to understand it alike. And I really, to use that is to make a point because if we understand it, all of us understand it, it'll be alike. Now, we may misunderstand it as many ways as there are individual people to misunderstand it. But when we all understand it, it'll be alike. It's the nature of us understanding the thing. And that's, that's just said when we say, do we understand it alike, just to make a point. Because if you understand it, we all understand it. That's all you can say about it. We all understand it. So it has to be alike. Jesus prayed for unity among his own followers, John 17, 20. When is the last time in talking to a denominational person who thinks that all churches are just denominations? They have nothing to do with our salvation. You believe on Christ and you believe only and you ask him to come to your heart to save you. You don't do anything in order to be saved. You don't think you are anyway. All of that's happening. But then they don't study about Jesus praying for unity that all of his believers will be one even as he and his Father are one. Surely they don't look around about them and say, well, that's where everybody is that claims to be a Christian. We're all one. That's ridiculous. But more than that, after the church was established, and when division rose in the church at Corinth, Paul, outright by the Spirit, writing part of the New Testament, commanded Christians to have the same mind. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13. And he repeated it to the church in Philippi in the second chapter in verse number 2. Where do you see that happening? What would happen today if every person who, in, 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 let's say in the Harris County, that'd be a lot of folks, every person that is sincere and zealous in whatever religion they're in that is claiming to believe in God, the Bible, and Christ, what if they all took these two verses and said, there's something wrong here. We're not all one. And what we believe and practice and teaching people how to be saved, how they worship God. We don't even belong to churches that wear the name of anything to do with Christ as we read of it in the Bible. Let's work to that end. Let's see how it is that all those who believe in Christ, the Son of God, can all be one as, as Christ prayed that we would be, even as he and his Father are one. And as Paul, inspired of the Spirit, commanded us to be. Well, folks, it would change all sorts of things. Now that's what happened back in the early part of the 19th century. In America I speak of now. And it started by simply saying, well, there's Methodists, and there's Baptists, and there's Presbyterians, and so on. How can that be when we all have the one Bible? Just one, everybody carries the same Bible and declares it to be the Word of God. How can we be all divided like this and they thought about the prayer of Christ and the commands of Paul to be of the same mind same judgment and lo and behold they can understand that much and thus the first resolve among those people was that it will be the Bible of the Bible only that will serve as our only rule of faith and practice and all these catechism creeds prayer books and manuals will be cast aside conventions of men and so forth and we're just going to go to the Bible. Well, tell me why that's not still the same approach we ought to take today. So on these obligatory matters, we're expected to be one. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 3 through 6. Did Jesus and Paul demand that which is unattainable? We just should ignore John 17, 20, 1 Corinthians 1, 10 
Philippians 2 and verse 2, we just, we just ignore them. They don't make any difference. They didn't say what they meant or they didn't mean what they said. That doesn't make any sense to a person that says the Bible is the Word of God. And I don't know of a denomination that wouldn't sing the B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand upon the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. But do they? And do we? And do we individually do so? So it's evidence that not many do not understand the Bible. And uh, they don't. Really, you know what it comes down to? They don't want to. I think we'll find, in our, by this looking in our own lives, that a whole lot of what we do and don't do, when we do it and how we do it, is to suit our own will. Now, that's all right, a lot of things. We are set freedom to do that. But not when it comes to what God requires of one to do in order to be saved and remain saved. So many don't understand the Bible. And therefore we see the mess that believers are in. But that raises a question. Why? Why? Well, there are certain reasons off given. They just simply say it can't be understood. But what have we seen already? It was written to be understood, both the Old and New Testaments. And as I said, and I'll repeat it for emphasis, to say that man cannot understand the Bible is simply to impugn God's ability to provide a revelation, to give us His will and to know how to do it. Then there are those, as I've said a couple times already, and we'll elaborate on it a bit, the so-called Spirit-filled, and I, by that I put it in quotes, and I mean those who think you have to have direct operation of the Spirit on you, or you can't understand what you're reading. And of course that causes a lot of folks to misunderstand and divide among themselves. Everyone claims the Spirit is leading them to their own understanding among these people who believe this. Now, what's interesting is that all those people who claim the Spirit's directly leading them are as divided as anybody could be. And then they will think, well, I can't understand it because how do you hear the Spirit speaking to you? And why is He saying one thing to me on a matter and on that same matter, something completely different to somebody else. So it's based upon a misreading and a misapplication of 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14. 1 Corinthians 2, 14, Paul wrote, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now, they rest that passage to make it mean you won't understand the Bible unless you have the Holy Spirit guiding you directly. But is that what's going on here? Because to draw that conclusion from 1 Corinthians 2.14 is simply a misreading and a misapplication of it. That one cannot understand spiritual things without the help of the Spirit is the point I'm making including understanding the Bible, that you have to have the Spirit's direct aid to understand it. We talk about context a great deal. Look at the context of verse 14. It's set in verses 6 through 13. Now look at 6, and we'll read through 13. Paul, uh, Paul wrote and said, How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect? Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught or nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory 
which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But now watch verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That's King James' rendition of that. What is he saying? The we here are simply the apostles through whom God by the Holy Spirit has revealed the whole New Testament doctrine. What is he saying? Well, the fellow who's going to depend strictly upon what we might call empirical knowledge nowadays, the person who does not depend upon revelation from God is not going to be able to understand these things. It would be like the surgeon who needs a scalpel to make an incision, but he doesn't have scalpel. And so it is. We have the will of Christ because the Holy Spirit revealed it to the apostles and prophets. Paul is saying this is how you got your Bible. This is how you got specifically the New Testament. He's not talking about today we have the Bible, we read it, and the Holy Spirit comes into our mind directly and says, now here's what this means, here's what this means. Here's. He's not saying that at all. Think about it. Paul has been baptized in the Holy Spirit. He has direct workings of the Holy Spirit as an ambassador of the court of heaven. And there are those the apostles laid hands on with different miraculous gifts because they had no fully written New Testament. And thus what they wrote and what they said before they wrote it when the Spirit guided them was to be understood by the people of that day. You think about when they were using the miraculous gifts so they would be benefited or edified spiritually in the church. It took words to do that. Now, if you can't understand the written word, why would you expect those people, say like from the prophets and inspired teachers, to understand what they said? It doesn't make sense. As I say, God created us to understand a certain way, to be communicated with in a certain way. And he chose words, vehicles of thought, signs of ideas. If I want to know God's idea, I've got to read a sign of his idea, and that's a word. Now listen, Paul said preach the word. The seed of the kingdom is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. The sword of the spirit is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. And Hebrews 4, 12 reads, now the spirit speaketh, or rather the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing sunder of the soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It didn't say the word as you look at it or you hear it and you grasp it. You then come to understand it because you have direct aid of the Spirit. It's not there. Such things no doubt were needed among the churches when there was no completed New Testament. But now we have it written. And so God has prepared things which man cannot perceive on his own. 1 Corinthians 2.9 God's revealed them to the apostles through the Spirit, who alone knows the mind of God. That's the point he makes in 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. The apostles of Christ received that which the Spirit revealed, that we might know the things given to us of God. Verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 2. And the apostles speak that which they received. And those are the words of the Spirit, as I noted in 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Paul, who's speaking? The Spirit. How's he, what's he speaking? Words. And he speaks them plainly or expressly. Paul knew that. They knew when they were writing words. 
the Spirit guided them to do so. And those words didn't originate with man. So, the proper meaning of 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16 is this. The natural man is one who depends upon simply and only human wisdom, such as, he says, the rulers of this world or age. And without the benefit of divine revelation, they never will know God's will. They're unable to, to receive the things of God, for they will not go to the revelation of God. They depend only on human wisdom. Thus, they consider God's words foolishness. That's the very point being made, 1 Corinthians 1, by Paul. Now, the spiritual man is the one who has the Spirit, such as the apostles. They've been given the revelation of God pertaining to how to become a Christian and live the Christian life all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now who is therefore able to judge all things and to not be judged by anyone? Why, well, it's the person that knows the book. You know when a person's telling the truth as, let's say, a preacher or a Bible teacher because you can read your own Bible. You can understand it. The apostles could prove that what they received came from heaven and not from man because of the miracle signs and wonders they did. They confirmed the word. So Paul is in this passage contrasting himself and all the apostles with uninspired men. That's the reason today when people stand up and say, well, God talked to me last night. I just remember what John said we've already studied. Verse John 1 and 2, he's a liar and the truth's not in him. God speaks today only, only, only via the word of God. Thus Jesus would say, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words. Sounds like he expects us to understand it. And to be able to delineate between it and other words. If you don't receive his word, he has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. The real reasons that people don't understand the Bible is first of all, we don't put forth the necessary interest and effort. We rarely study the Bible. We're so ignorant of just what the words say. And thus, even if we get to the point of becoming Christians, we remain babes in our knowledge and understanding and how to deal with things. So it's like a fellow was teaching one time and, and said, uh, well, at least a member of the class said back to him, well, I just don't understand that. I just don't see that. Well, the point is, they don't. Why don't they see it in many instances? They don't know the Bible. So we're back to the Old Testament. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Obviously, that says you could understand it, but you haven't done what's necessary to understand it. And many study the Bible for the wrong reasons. There is a um, tale told, and it may be even on an old film clip of W.C. Fields laying up in bed, and it was told that it actually happened after he died that somebody walked in to visit him and he had the Bible. He was looking at it and he was surprised because he's such a worldly character. They said, see, you're reading the Bible. He said, yeah, I'm looking for loopholes. So they may spend a lot of time with it. They don't have the right motive. If you don't have the right motive for studying the Bible, you might as well not study it. It might help you get the right motive, but that'd be the only thing you'd have to do. You'd have to have the right motive. Jesus talked about those hungry and thirsting after righteousness. They're the one going to be filled. If you don't have that kind of desire for the Word of God, you're not going to have to be filled. Also, people just set about to prove what, themselves right. That, in other words, they read only to justify their own conduct or beliefs. They're not really interested to see, does the Bible really teach what I believe? Does the Bible really authorize me to act this way? Or they just say, well, I've got to prove him wrong. He believes different from me. So they read only to find arguments to support their position. They're not reading it as the word of God given to them personally so they can study it with the right attitude to learn the truth. 
It doesn't mean that they don't have conviction of the truth they've learned. It just means you approach it to study it, to learn the truth for yourself. And many fail to apply their God-given common sense. If you pick up Dungan's Hermeneutics textbook, <laughs> written about 1882, one of the first things it will say is to being able to understand the Bible under the rules of interpretation is common sense. And it defines, it defines common sense as being able to see the likeness in things and the opposites in things. We do it all the time. This pie tastes like, and we choose something everybody's familiar with, say so it tastes like that. Or we ask somebody, what that taste like? What are we asking them? We ask them to give us an answer that we can understand. So we need to use that in understanding the Bible. That's the way God made us to work and teach and understand. And such as looking up words they don't understand, that's an important thing. People don't. I, all my life in answering questions, people have been members of the church a long time. They'll raise a question, and that's all right. I'm glad to answer it, and so is other uh, are the faithful preachers. But why do they look it up in the Bible dictionary? Uh, I don't know. But I think rarely people read their Bibles or the Bible dictionary beside it, or even the English dictionary. And they don't understand a lot of times the design and purpose of, say, like a Greek lexicon. You have to do more work to be able to use that properly. But you don't have to get there. We have accurate translations into English of the ancient words of the Bible, and we can know it. The key to it is a determination on your part that you're going to study it, to understand it, because you personally want to be pleasing to God, whether anybody else on this earth is or not. So we have to take into consideration all that God's Word says on the subject. Many people aren't willing to do that. And the passage we've just looked at in 1 Corinthians 2, that passage is readily misunderstood by all sorts of people. Because they don't realize Paul is saying, here's how you got the Bible. It didn't come through human wisdom. It came through the apostles of Christ. Early church did understand that, Acts 2, verse 42. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So we have to study it book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Now I know the chapters and verses were put in there by people, but they were put in there to help. It's just a way of saying you have to study everything in it. There is no shortcut. It's just not. Starting at the beginning, reading through it. So the problem is not with God's Word. The problem is with the lazy, slothful attitude sloppy attitude in handling God's Word. That's the reason you have such admonitions as 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So the Bible can be understood. We didn't go into all the different things that one might need known as to how the New Testament authorizes and how we ascertain that authority of our king. But we have, I think, well enough shown that God gave us the Bible to be understood. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That's what that's saying. If you're not a Christian today, if you don't understand what the New Testament teaches about how to become a Christian, you can. If you want to. And if you want to, if your want to has led you to understand it, but you still won't obey it, well, you got another problem. First of all, it's not thinking about the fact you may never see home again today. You may go into eternity before you get there. Plenty of folks have, plenty of folks will, and they'll never see the sunset. So today's the day of salvation, and now is the accepted time to believe that Christ, the Son of God, repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Him and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Being added to the Lord, or to the church by the Lord, Acts 2.47, to live righteously before Him in knowing what God requires from the New Testament, one to do to be faithful to the Lord as a Christian. If you've wandered from the pathway of righteousness as a child of God, the remedy is easy in understanding it. To repent of sins, confess your sins, and pray God for forgiveness. Are you subject to the invitation of Christ? If so, we invite you to respond to it while we stand and sing.